Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Active Shooter Planning and Response in a Healthcare Setting. My name is Rick Kondravy, and I will be your moderator for this program. All materials are provided for your educational use, and as always, we welcome your comments and questions. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Bruce Beseth has worked for WellSpan York Hospital for 15 years as the Security Operations Manager and Training and Investigation Coordinator. With oversight of security training for the WellSpan hospitals in multiple off-site locations, Bruce has developed numerous education programs, including active shooter response training. He uh, retired as a captain from York City Police after 27 years of service. He served in various leadership roles and areas of expertise during that time. Over the years, he has been the recipient of multiple awards and honors. Bruce, I will now turn the program over to you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Rick, I appreciate that. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Rick said, my name is Bruce Beats. That's on the Security Training and Investigative Coordinator. Um, so we're going to be talking about a variety of different uh, issues today, uh, mainly focusing on active shooters and how you can do prepare for events like that. And pre-planning events is, is critical. So we do this training not to scare people, but just to make everybody aware of that these events happen, although um, they, you've seen them more frequently happen throughout the, the country right now. They are still rare in healthcare. However, it can happen at any place at any time, so that's why we feel it's important to do this training. So the first thing I'm going to do is show a video of an active shooter situation um, at a college setting. And even though it's not a healthcare facility, it really doesn't matter because it really focuses on the three basic things that you'll hear me talk about a little bit later on and what you need to, to do to prepare and to uh, survive an event like that if you ever get caught up in that. So I'm going to let the video play, and then we'll go into some slides after that. There are many partners who work together to make your campus safe. The likelihood of an active shooter occurrence on your campus is extremely remote. However, when the unthinkable happens, it's essential to be prepared to act, just like you would in a fire. Follow the directions of 
police. Choose a safe exit. Don't attract the shooter's attention. Protect yourself first before helping others. Find a secure room or space. Turn off the lights. Cover windows. Get out of the line of fire. Lock the door and barricade it if you can. How much shooting? We got to lock down. We're gonna be safe. Don't worry. Improvise. Stay out of the line of fire. Get under desks or behind tables. Mute your phone. Be quiet. Wait for police to come to you. barricade doors. Stay out of the line of fire. Be quiet. Please remember, we're not going to be in this. When you can't get out or hide, your last resort may be to fight. You turn off the light. Wait, get under the deck, everybody. Whether you are alone or with a group, be ready to fight for your life. Commit to aggressive action. Mentally prepare yourself to physically fight. It would be a fight for your life. It's your decision. So I like showing that video because it really kind of gets you thinking outside the box on what you need to do if you ever find yourself in a situation like that. So some of the other objectives we're going to be uh, covering today in, in addition to response to an active shooter is how to tell the difference between an active shooter uh, situation and a hot seat situation, um, how to develop an active shooter a threat assessment checklist how to recognize potential workplace violence threats and how to protect yourself in public places. So first of all, um, we have a pretty good system at York Hospital for WellSpan on how you can make notification if there is an active shooter event at the hospital. Um, our staff is uh, um, encouraged to call two numbers, 911 to get the police response, and then our security hotline number, which is 851 
um, telecommunications center is notified and they put this uh, alert on the uh, boards on the monitors throughout the hospital. And um, it's going to sound a little bit loud, but this is what it sounds like. Security alert. Armed intruder. Staff take appropriate action. Security alert. Armed intruder. Staff take appropriate action. So that alarm is going to repeat itself three times. It's going to uh, come across our TV monitors, which are, are located throughout the hallways um, for other uh, re events. It's going to say armed intruder, and it's going to give you a location. So at the very least, you know, staff should stay away from the, that location, which in this particular one is the atrium cafe. But in all reality, they really should stay away from any public areas and, and try to, uh, you know, get out of public view because these events can happen very quickly and that individual could be at one location a minute ago, but now he's at a different location. So a couple key things, so is when you're calling, um, obviously if you have two different numbers, you know, you want to call, you know, hopefully it's the police and then your local security. You want to give location, number of suspects, physical description, uh, number of type of weapons and injuries, but you want to be very clear on the, your location. Um, you know, give as much information as you can. Don't automatically assume that the police know exactly where you're located at, you know, especially if you have a, a smaller facility. Um, several years ago, one of our off-site locations, they had a disruptive patient at a location and uh, two local police departments were having a hard time finding that building. And finally, another police officer who was monitoring them got on the radio and told them where the location was. And the only reason why he knew where the location was is because his wife worked there. So again, give as much information as you can, especially when you're calling 911. So during an active shooter event, you want to quickly determine what's reasonable to protect your own life. Patients and visitors are likely to follow your lead. So you can want to try to help people out, especially if they're not familiar with the building. Um, but like the video says, you have to protect yourself first before you can protect others. So if you're in a safe area and you can get other people in a safe area, that's great. But if you have to cross paths with that individual to try to get somebody help, it might be best to stay in place where you're at. That sounds a little cold and harsh, but again, you have to protect yourself first before you can protect others. And then finally, you wanna understand how law enforcement responds to these events and how you should react. And we'll talk about how they've changed their response over the years. So in the video, they call it get out, hide, fight, uh, the most common terminology is run, hide, fight. Other people call it evacuate, hide out, take action. Other people call it avoid, deny, defend. Other people call it secure, preserve, fight. It really doesn't matter what you call it. It's three basic things. Get out, run from the area, evacuate from the area, avoid the area, hide, hide, hide out, get into a room and deny entry, lock the door, and then finally fight, fight, take action, and defend yourself. So we're going to kind of focus on run, hide, fight, but you have to remember, it's not always necessarily in that order. It really depends on where you are to the nearest exit, where you are to the nearest room that can lock, and then obviously how close you are to the individual that has the weapon. So talking about running, you want to have an escape route and plan in mind. Um, leave your belongings behind. Like I said, try to help other people if you can, but you also want to remember as, as you're leaving, keep your hands visible. You know, try to raise your hand, spread your fingers, and show to first responders or police as you're going out and they're coming in that you're not a threat to them. And the best way to do that is, is to have your hands clear of anything. Even if you're carrying a cell phone, at a moment's glance, that could be mistaken for a weapon. So again, you want to make sure that you're, you're particularly, you know, telling the police or showing them that you're not a threat to them by having open hands. And it's key, again, is knowing where your exits are. So, you know, most of you work in a big building and are familiar with a, a, an exit at one location where you work, but think about when you're on the other side of that building, do you know where your exits are? It's very important for that. I did a safety presentation one time at a location at a family practice, and during my talk, someone had mentioned, oh, I would just use the stairwell at the end of the building there. And someone had mentioned, oh, I didn't even know we had a stairwell there. And um, that person had worked in that building for seven years and it wasn't really a big building. So again, know where your exits are. And this is a diagram that shows why this is important. This is a station nightclub club fire from several years ago back in 2003. The band Great White was, was uh, 
playing on the stage here. They set off pyrotechnics. It caught on the ceiling um, and caught on fire within 15, 20 seconds. A hundred people died in, in, that, in that building. And you can see this is a diagram of the building and it shows where they found the, the people at. Um, 18 here, nine here, you know, 10 and nine over it, up there. And 31 people died, you know, trying to get out the main entrance. And that's because they were familiar with the main entrance. That's where they came in, they paid their tickets, but, and that's where they tried to get out. But, you know, somebody fell down and then somebody fell on top of them and they got stuck. And yet still people tried to get out that way and they got caught up and a lot of people ended up dying in that hallway. The tragedy of that event was there was three other stairwells uh, two on the left left side, two exits over here, and one over here. And if someone was even in the kitchen, um, you know, directing people near that at the entrance to the kitchen, they could have possibly saved all 19 of those people because look how close they were to where that, that exit is. So it's very important, not only when you're um, at work, but if you're at a big event or something, look around and look for alternative exits because if there is an active shooter or even a fire, um, people are going to try to get out one entrance and you want to look for alternative exits so that you can get out. And these people are prime examples why you would do that. Um, these three people here were involved in, in two shootings over the last couple of years. They were involved in the Las Vegas shooting. Uh, the lady here is actually a nurse and helped the one gentleman in the back there was, that was in a wheelchair. And this is a picture of her at the, um, at the Las Vegas shooting. But then about a year later, they were at a garlic festival of all things in California. And they recognized, um, they all said in interviews, they recognized the gunfire right away. And they knew, you know, because they'd been in that event before, they knew what they needed to do and, and got out quickly. And they also looked for alternative exits. So when people were running one way, they went to an area where they could get out a lot quicker. So again, you know, you know the chances of being caught up in that twice, but again, just through their experience, they were able to survive both those events. So the next thing is hiding, getting out of view, blocking your entrances, locking your doors, turning out your lights, blocking your windows, you know, staying away from your doors and windows and taking cover behind thick objects. Uh, so once you get into a room, you know, get behind a desk or get behind a file cabinet, uh, you know, remain calm and quiet. You know, that's not always easy to do, but you have to be quiet. And then remember to turn off your cell phone. You don't want to have your cell phone going off, especially when that individual's right outside the door, because if he hears your cell phone go off, now he knows that someone is in there and he's going to try a little bit harder to get into that room. But just like knowing where your, where your exits are, it's important to establish ahead of time where rooms can lock. Um, it could be, you know, nurse manager's office, it could be conference rooms, locker rooms. Um, you know, usually patient rooms do not lock, however, bathrooms do, so that's one area you could possibly get a, yourself and a patient in. But again, knowing ahead of time where you need to go in, in case there is an event and pre-planning that out ahead of time is crucial, just like knowing where your exits are. And this has been a video of a, of a drill that we did several years ago. And this shows you why it's not a good example to open up the door just because someone says they're the police. Our bad guy told him to go back and knock on the door and act like you're the police. Open the door, it's the police, I'm trying to help you. So a little over dramatic acting on everybody's part, but in reality, you really should wait for police or security to open up the door. Again, just going back to the video, you see the police knocking on the door and the one student starts to get up and the teacher, you know, tells her to, you know, to stay put. Really, that's what you should do because there have been cases where the bad guys have, have acted like the police and have gotten into a room. So again, you, you want to stay in that room and make sure you don't open it up. And unless you're absolutely sure that the police are on the outside. So finally, fighting. And this is a last resort um, when, when you can't go anywhere. And I'm, we're not advocating running after somebody, you know, going out in the hallway, you know, running out in the parking lot. But when you're confronted by the individual and you can't run and you can't hide, you're going to have to do whatever you can. Um, you're going to have to act as aggressively as possible. Uh, look for items that you can use, you know, throwing items, using improvised weapons. Um, you know, yelling and screaming and being committed to your action. 
Again, referring to the video, you see the individual coming down the stairs, you know, someone hits him in the ankles with a chair and someone hits him over top of the head with a fire extinguisher and then they jump on top of him and disarm him and get the gun away from him. So if you're in a room, you know, look around what you can, you know, even if you're in a locked and secured room, think about what you could use as an improvised weapon in case that individual does come in. Um, and again, you have to be committed to your action. This is another drill that we did uh, at one of our, uh, at our rehab hospital, and you'll see a young lady take action here. That's our bad guy there. Jam. So she picked up the blood pressure machine um, and, and, you know, disarmed them or disrupted them with that. And, and that she recognized that they were in a curtain off area. So number one, they didn't pick a great area to hide it, but she realized at some point that gunman's gonna come down to her. And that's why she took action, picks up the blood pressure machine, you know, and tried to uh, distract them with that. But what would have been even better if the rest of the people in that room would have also helped her out, or if they all would have came up with a plan, okay, I'm gonna hit them with this. Uh, the rest of us are gonna rush out and, and jump on top of them. So when you're in a room, kind of you know, come up with a plan and think about what you're going to do. The other thing is when you're in a room, kind of spread out so that you're not all congregated in one area and you're an easy target for somebody. You wanna kind of spread out so if he does come into the room, now you know, someone, you know, he could be focused on one group of people, but somebody else could possibly get behind him. So usually during my presentations, I always ask who's ever been involved in a fight. And most of the time people will say that they really haven't been you know, involved in a fight. And I understand that. So if you find yourself in a situation like that, you might think, well, I don't think I could do what those people do. Well, I'm gonna talk briefly about the Gabby Gifford shooting from back in 2011. And four people were instrumental in, in jumping on top of the gunman. And these were the four people. Um, the gentleman here in the big picture on, on your right hand side, I saw in an interview, he actually said, I was standing right next to the gunman when, when um, you know, he was shooting and I realized it was either him or me and I had to do something. And he'd actually been shot in the neck, but he, um, through his training, being in the army, he still jumped on top of the gunman and then the three other individuals jumped on top of him and they held that gunman down and kept him from reloading the gun until police could take over. So the, the moral of the story is at the right time, at the right place, all four of those people were instrumental in not only saving their lives, but saving the lives of others. And if you look at the three people in the big picture here, all three of them were over the age of 60. So if you think you can never do something like that, think about those three individuals. So I'm gonna talk real briefly about Christina and, and Sam, they were both in, involved in, in mass shootings. Christina was involved in the Virginia Tech shooting and Sam was involved in the Columbine shooting. And this is Christina being carried out. She was actually shot three times. I got a chance to see her. She goes around the country and speaks and talks about her experience. And in all honesty, she would tell you that she would do things a little bit differently. I'm also briefly gonna talk about Derek. He was also involved in the Virginia Tech shooting. And I'll show you the difference between how his classroom responded and how her classroom responded. And this is a diagram of the building. So about nine o'clock on a April morning, um, Christine was sitting in, in room 211 here and described it as she heard, you know, explosions, things going on. And actually what had happened, the gunman had gone into room 206 right next to her and started shooting. Um, Christina's class, they didn't respond, you know, they weren't sure what was going on. Uh, the gunman came out of 206 and then actually went into 207, um, which was Eric's classroom. And then he finally came into Christina's classroom. Probably about two minutes had expired from that time. By then the, the teacher finally had gotten up and was going to close the door, but by then it was too late. The gunman was right at the door. He pushed his way through the door, shot and, and, and killed the teacher, and then systematically went around and shot everybody in Christine's classroom. Most of them, like Christina, just laid on the desk and played dead. He then left and tried to go back into Derek's classroom. And this is the difference between Derek's classroom. Um, you know, once that gunman left, Derek, even though he was shot in the arm, he along with whatever students were still able to, 
barricaded the door and kept that gunman from coming back in. At some point, the gunman tried to come back in, but nobody else was hurt in, in this. And the red squares, you can see, signify people that did not survive, and the black squares signify people that did not make it. He then goes back into Christina's classroom and then, again, systematically goes around and shoots everybody again. And again, Christina, you know, played dead. He finally goes back out, uh, goes and goes back in and then shoots uh, some more people, shoots her for the third time, and then finally kills himself. So a couple of things she would probably tell you is, you know, they would have locked the door right away. Um, again, if it sounds like gunfire, treat it like it's gunfire, just like in the video, it, it talks about that. Even the deaf lady, she couldn't hear what was going on, but she could see the reaction of other people so that she knows something's going on. So you can't hesitate. And then the, fine, the next thing is, you know, with Christina is with her, you know, knowing that, you know, he, he shot her once, I probably wouldn't have played dead the second time. I would have done whatever I could to try to survive that. So again, it's not only important to respond to these situations quickly, but, you know, to take the appropriate action. Um, up here in classroom 204, the teacher actually barricaded the door and held the door open while, while students were able to jump out. Unfortunately, he was shot and killed, but he saved a lot of lives of students, you know, by doing that. So next I'm going to talk about Sam. Sam was involved in the Columbine shooting, and I saw him on interviews uh, where he talked about his event. So he was sitting in the cafeteria of the high school at the time and described it just like Christina did, that, you know, loud explosions, things were going on, but they weren't sure what was happening when the two kids were shooting. At some point, a teacher came by and told him, you really need to get out of here. I'm not sure what's going on, but you need to get out of here and take cover. Uh, they kind of ignored the teacher, and Sam said it wasn't until the teacher came back and started cursing at him that they finally took some action. So he was one of 17 students. They ran in back to, into a storage unit uh, uh, room back in the kitchen, and it didn't lock um, the door, but Sam, through his training, or not through his training, but through his life experience, when he was a younger kid and his brother used to chase him around the house, Sam would get into his door and put his feet against the door and keep his brother from coming in. And that's what he actually did. He put his feet against the door and actually people laid on top of his legs. And at some point, you know, someone, they could hear two voices outside, which they assumed were the two kids. And, and there was a struggle. They tried to open up the door, but everybody, um, you know, because they were holding the door, the door the door couldn't open. They kept quiet. They didn't say anything. Eventually, those two voices went down the hallway, and, and later on, they could actually hear some gunshots. So that's why they're assuming it was those two kids. But, you know, because Sam finally listened to his teacher there, everybody in, in that room survived. And in fact, when the police finally got to him about two hours later, they had barricaded so much stuff in front of the door then, it took about 15 minutes to get all that stuff so they could open up the door. But again, they were all safe because this teacher here, Dave Sanders, had warned them um, about, you know, you know, taking cover. And this is a picture of him, and this was the cafeteria, which was completely filled at the time. Um, unfortunately, Dave, you know, went around. Uh, when he came out of the cafeteria, he was confronted by the gunman, and he was shot. And he, he ended up bleeding to death because they couldn't get to him right away. But he saved a lot of lives that day. So what do you do when law enforcement arrives? Uh, again, you know, remaining calm, follow their directions. Again, don't have any items in your hands. You know, raise your hands, you know, spread your fingers. You know, no sudden movements. Do not grab at the officers. You know, don't avoid pointing, yelling, or screaming. And realize that the first officers are not there to help injured people. Their job is to get to that gunman as quick as possible. Um, if you know where the gunman is, you know, tell them, you know, where he is and let them go do his thing. Um, if the police tell you to get down on the ground, get down on the ground, follow their directions. Um, and again, after Columbine, police changed it, their tactics. Um, they no longer wait for the tactical teams. They would have the first three or four officers that would respond to the scene. It would be uniform officers. It could be officers from different areas. Um, but they're going to respond to the scene, and they're going to listen and look for where the gunfire is and try to get to that gunman as quick as possible. And this is what they're going to look like. This is another drill that we did. And you can see they're kind of going slow. Now they hear the shots. Now they're starting to speed up. You can see them. They're not going to stop and help injured people. But 
their job is to get to that gunman as quick as possible because once they get to the gunman, the event's going to end one way or the other. And this is what they look like. So it's in the, in the top two pictures. It's most likely going to be, you know, patrol officers. It could be plainclothes officers. It's not necessarily going to be the tactical team because after Columbine, they realized they were waiting for the tactical team to enter the high school. And um, as a result, those two kids were still going through the high school. So shortly after uh, Columbine, every department in the United States start, started training in what they call an active shooter response. I was with, still with York City Police at the time before I retired, and we started training in, in that. And even though in that video there was two different departments in there, and those two departments had never trained together like that, but because they take universal training throughout Pennsylvania, you can fit it, officers in at any location, and they're going to know how to do and what to respond to this. So again, this is how you should look when you're coming out. You know, keep your hands up in the air, spread your fingers. You know, make sure you're portraying to the police that you're not a threat. You can see as the police are running to this location, you know, the students are walking out with their hands up in the air, and that's what you really should be doing. You know, don't, don't pose any threat to the officers. This is a video of a Navy Yard shooting suspect. Um, you actually see him coming into the building here, and this is a real thing. You're not going to see any, any, any uh, shooting or anything, but this is how these guys kind of move throughout the building looking for potential victims, going from one floor to the other. And the video is going to stop here shortly, but you can see people down at the end of the hallway here. And I honestly, I don't know how they made out. But again, you know, a couple keys. If you're in a locked room, stay in a locked room. Um, locked doors save lives. And we've done drills before where people have kind of looked around and they've got a little bit antsy and, and next thing you know, they're gonna open up the door to see what's going on. And there's their, our bad guy right outside the door. So they now not only compromise themselves, but the other people in the room. Um, the other thing is if you do have to move, just don't start running down the hallway, kind of look where you're going so that you don't accidentally run in, into the gunman. Um, but you know, staying in locked rooms is, is prime examples. Uh, Sandy Hook, Virginia Beach, um, you know, the shooting down in Parkland. A lot of people lost their lives, but you have to remember that a lot of lives were saved because teachers and students and, and employees got in the rooms and, and stayed in those locked rooms and stayed in there and, until you could get into that, you know, until the event was over and survive the event. So there is a difference between a, a hostage situation and an active shooter in a hostage situation. Is, is where uh, where someone's holding you against their will, but they haven't harmed anybody yet. And, and it could be a variety of different reasons why they're doing it. Um, you know, unhappy with healthcare could be, you know, one of the prime ones. But so again, there's a big difference between an active shooting event, someone that's actively shooting, or someone that's holding a hostage. Uh, in this particular case, this individual is holding his boss uh, against his will, faked uh, or strapped a fake dynamite around him. But police response is going to be different, and they're going to, you know, they are going to bring the tactical teams out. They're going to try to negotiate with that individual. And in this particular case, after a couple hours, they were get to get that individual to surrender, and and both him and his boss were unharmed. So again, the, uh, on a hostage situation, you are going to respond a little bit different. So if he hasn't harmed anybody. You want to be patient. You know, time is on your side. Um, the first 45 minutes are potentially the most dangerous. Um, usually, if they haven't harmed anybody in that period of time, they're not necessarily going to. Um, you want to stay calm. You know, try to be cooperative and be respectful. Um, try to maintain a positive eye contact, but not stare. With, you know, staring at them. And you want to build a rapport with them. But in the same sense, if you're inside a locked room with that individual. You want to think in your head, okay, this individual hasn't harmed anybody, but what are we going to do if he starts, you know, shooting somebody? Because now we're locked in a room and we can't run and we can't hide. So we're going to have to do whatever we can to survive that event. So, you know, think about a possible situation in your head. Well, what you could do and look for possible weapons in case that individual does. Again, police response is going to be different. They are going to set up their their tactical team outside. They're going to try to negotiate. But again, if they hear shots fired, they're going to, you know, send that team in. So we do have a book here that, that talks, um, you know, everybody should have an emergency preparedness book here. 
um, you know, related. This is what we have for your hospital. And as you can see, we used to call it code silver. So it's, um, you don't want to necessarily call it code silver. You want to use plain language. Um, and again, we, we now have gone to plain language and we just call it armed intruder. So if you're using like code silver, you know, code gray or something, you know, you want to think about something universal so everybody understands. And this next diagram shows you why it's important to respond quickly. This is from the Dayton, Ohio shooting from a couple of years ago. Um, that police were right around the corner when that individual started shooting and responded within 32 seconds. But within that 32 seconds, that individual shot and killed nine people. So again, just like the video says, if it sounds like gunfire, treat it like it's gunfire and, and react quickly, just like Christina's class should have done. You know, don't hesitate and react quickly because again, 32 seconds is not a long period of time, but a lot can happen during that time. So, and especially if you're at a building where there is no security, um, you know, you got to remember that you are the first line of, re of, of defense or the first responders. So you have to come up with a game plan on, you know, just like you do with a fire drill. How do you respond to a fire drill? You know, play out through your head. How do you respond to these situations and, and how you can survive with that? So again, you want to be aware of your environment and potential situations. Know where your exits are, you know, and know where rooms can be locked, you know, especially at work, but also if you're out at a public venue, kind of look around and look where your exits are in case something happens like a fire or an active shooter. Um, these events are going to be very trying and chaotic. So again, if you kind of pre-planned and thought ahead of time what you're going to need to do, you're, you're not going to get bogged down and, 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 and freeze up. You know, you want to develop that survivalist mindset so that you can think clearly. Um, just like the young lady did, you know, where she picked up the blood pressure machine, you know, you back up, you know, you hit the individual and he doesn't go down, back up and hit him again. You know, do, you know, keep fighting until you disarm that individual. Um, if you can't run and you can't hide. And again, you can't hesitate. Um, you have to respond quickly. And you want to try to keep the safety of others and, and others in mind. And again, you know, follow whatever, you know, law enforcement tells you to do and follow their lead. So the next things we're going to talk about is safety in the workplace. So things that you want to be aware of, um, you know, when people are talking to you, you want to be aware of potential violence. And when people are talking to themselves, when they're talking about losing control, when they're talking about frustration or, or retaliation, when they're talking about challenging the rules of authority, when they're making unreasonable demands, when they're making threats or shouting or cursing, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to jump over the counter and attack you, but you want to raise your awareness level, let other people know what's going on, that you're dealing with a difficult person so that they can help you out if, if the need be. But if someone starts talking about weapons, you want to, you want to, you have to take every threat serious and, and re make sure that you notify people and respond to that. Uh, a, a couple times at Wellspan, we've had, you know, uh, talks about different weapons and stuff. One time we had two patients who were standing in line. Uh, the one patient started yelling and, and cursing. He was waiting too long. The other patient made the mistake of saying someone oh, must be having a cranky day. Well, then that other patient then turned around to him and said, look, I don't like what you said to me. I'm going to go out to my car, I'm going to get a gun, and I'm going to come back inside and shoot you. Staff was unsure what to do. Um, they did eventually call the police and security, but they didn't give them the full details. But once that patient that made the threat went outside to the building, the one thing that they should have done is lock the door. Now, fortunately for them, he got in his car and he left. Police ended up stopping him, and it turns out he didn't have a gun or anything. Uh, but think how catastrophic that would have been if he would had a gun in his car and he came back inside because they didn't they failed to lock the door. The other thing they didn't do, there was three other offices in that building, and they didn't notify the other offices what was going on. And what they really should have done is, hey, we just had a situation, you know, you know, happen here where a, a gentleman made a threat. He's outside, you know, lock all your doors. Keep people away from the windows, get them out of the waiting rooms, lock your doors, and let's wait for police. The other potential thing, you know, that's you know, a big risk for a lot of healthcare facilities is domestic violence situation. So we always encourage people, if you're going through any problems or anything, uh, you know, especially if there's threats of weapons or something, that you should bring that to the attention of your, your supervisor or security. 
Again, we had a, a situation several years ago at one of our off-site locations where well, one of our female staff members got into a phone conversation with her husband. He made a threat to her saying, I'm coming to your facility, I have a gun. And uh, she called the police. Police ended up stopping him about a mile away from the building. Um, just like the other individual, it turns out he didn't have a gun or anything, they got him secured. But when they came back to talk to her and walked in her office, no one else knew what was going on. And she hadn't told anybody else what, what had just happened. Um, we talked to her about that and her response was, well, that's my own personal business. Well, it is your own personal business, but again, what about your fellow staff member? So what she really should have done is, hey, I just got off the phone with my husband. He's threatening to come to our facility with gun. Let's lock the doors. Let's get everybody out of the waiting room and let's wait till police respond to that. So again, if you know of anybody that's going through that, or if you overhear a conversation, we always encourage people, you know, if they overhear a conversation, especially if there's mention about a weapon, bring that to the attention of somebody so at least they can follow up to see if that threat is credible or not. There's things that we do sometimes, um, or there's things that, uh, uh, physical clues that you wanna pick up on sometimes. Obviously, if people are uh, pacing, making loud sighs, if they're tapping their fingers, if they got that thousand yard stare, which literally means they're kind of staring through you. Again, you want to pay attention to that. Um, in the Virginia Beach shooting from several years ago that some of the people that survived uh, ended up confronting the gunman and they said he just had that glazed look on him and he was just, you know, out there and just kind of like staring through them. Uh, you know, if they're clenching their fists, if they're, you know, making punch movements, if they're exaggerated stretching or cracking knuckles, if they change their breathing patterns. And then obviously, you know, if you're dealing with someone that's dazed or staggering or, un, you know, under the influence, you want to be careful when you're dealing with people like that. I always tell, you know, staff members, you know, you got to remember when you're talking to people that body language accounts for about 60 to 90 percent of the communications that you give to people. So if you look at these three people on the, on the left-hand side over, over here, you can see just through their facial expressions that they, you know, they're disinterested, they're smug or angry, as opposed to the young lady here, she's gonna have a better chance of, you know, getting that person to calm down and, and, and being able to respond to that individual. So if you look at just the body language here, which one would you rather deal with? Hopefully most of us would rather deal with guy number two, but just look at, at the body language. So it's not only important on what you say, but think about how your facial expressions are and how you look when you're saying it. Um, there's things that we do sometimes that can make a situation worse. And I, I've seen that throughout my career um, at, on the police force. I've seen it in healthcare. Um, you know, you, sometimes you always have that one employee, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, I got this situation because if they get involved in a situation, they're gonna make it, make it worse sometimes. So, you know, if you're not providing, you know, failing to provide updates or insurances, you know, using threats to gain compliance, you know, taking action without explaining the procedure, ignoring patients or customers, you know, failing to listen or being disrespectful, uh, you know, crowding into someone's personal space, you want to be careful about that. Um, the same way, you know, you know, there's people that really like to get up close to you and talk. So if, if that makes you uncomfortable, you know, step away from that person or try to distance yourself, you know, maybe put a barrier between you, you know, step around so that there's a chair or a desk so that they can't get right close to you. Um, but the keys are, you know, uh, you know, when you start uh, criticizing or lecturing or speaking in, in a condescending manner, if that person is upset about the situation, now they're gonna end up focusing a lot of their situation on you because they're gonna be upset at, at you because you've either criticized or you're condescending to them. Uh, the other key is, you know, turning your back on someone during a conversation. Um, you want to be careful. You know, to some people, that's a sign of disrespect. And the other people, uh, you know, the other thing is, if you're sh you turn your back, you're saying to them, hey, if you're thinking about attacking me, uh, go ahead because I'm not going to pay attention to you. Uh, the other thing is raising your voice or you know, pointing fingers. Um, you know, if someone starts talking loud, human instinct is you're going to try to talk over them. They're going to raise their voice and try to talk over you. Um, and pretty soon you're gonna look like these two idiots. So what you really should try to do is if someone talks to you loud, you know, take a deep breath and even if they said something hurtful or harmful, take a deep breath and think about what you're gonna say before you say it. 
um, because if you said something in a fit of anger or if you raised your voice, <clears throat> again, now that person is not only going to be mad at the situation, but they're going to focus most of their anger on you. So again, you want to talk slowly and softly. Um, you know, think about what you're going to say before you say it. You want to avoid physical contact if you can. You know, offer choices, be, in, be flexible. Use, got, you know, good nonverbal skills. Um, if you have to go into a room and if you think it could be a potentially dangerous situation, think about your positioning when you go in that room. You know, don't be on the other side of the bed in case someone lashes out at you and you're going to have to fight your way out of the room. You know, try to be close to the door if possible. Um, you know, obviously keep a safe distance from that, you know, that person. You know, especially if you're having a heated conversation and then someone says, hey, let's go outside. I want to talk about this. You know, don't do that. You know, stay in an area where other people can, you know, see you. And then stay calm and stay alert. And you want to, you know, again, you want to make sure that you notify other staff members and supervisors. You know, hey, I'm, I have to go into a room. I, I've had some difficulty with this person. Kind of watch me and listen for it and come in the room in case you hear any yelling or screaming. And again, the keys are, you know, if you see something, say something. And that's, that's the key thing. Um, you know, in this day and age, you know, you know, trust your gut instincts. If you see, think something's, you know, abnormal, please bring that to the attention of somebody. Um, over the years, we, we've had a lot of different shootings over the years in, in regards to different events and, and stuff. And there's been, you know, a lot of shootings and stuff. But you got to remember, over the last couple of years, there's been events where they've been stopped because people have responded to this situation. Um, just a couple of months ago, that the grocery store shooting, everybody's familiar with that. But a lot of people don't realize is a couple of days after that, an individual had walked into a bathroom and he heard the sound of, he was familiar with firearms, but he heard the sound of a gun being, you know, racked through, you know, loading and he looked down and he could see a, a cash load of weapons underneath the the bathroom stall so he alerted police police got to that building before that individual um was able to do anything but he had a, an ar style rifle and he was ready to do the same thing that just happened a couple days ago another event that happened was a, a woman was on facebook um she had biracial kids and somebody made a comment about her kids and then she kind of followed that individual and saw that he was making threats about going to a school. And even though she lived 1,000 miles away, she alerted the local authorities about that event. And the local authorities actually went to his house and got him as he was walking out to his car. And here he, he had 20 rounds of ammunition in his car, and he was headed to a school. So because of both those actions, those people prevented, you know, further tragic, you know, active shooter events. And, and again, just in the three weeks following, you know, a couple of years ago of the four mass shootings in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, at least 30 individuals were detained because other people responded and alerted authorities. So know what to look for when, when you're dealing with an employee, a patient, or, uh, or client. You know, look about depression or withdrawal, you know, repeated violations of your, your policies, explosive outbursts of angers, unexplained increases in absenteeism, you know, decrease in attention to appearance and hygiene, you know, talk of severe financial problems or previous uh, incidents of violence. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to come in the, in the next day, you know, and be an active shooter. But again, you want to raise, raise your awareness level and be alert, you know, and, and kind of watch that person. The other thing is, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, system allows, you know, you know, look at people on Facebook and see what they're saying or social media things and follow what they're saying and to see, you know, if they're making any comments or anything. Um, in healthcare facilities, active shooter threat assessment checklist. So you, you want to develop this checklist so that you can, you know, if, if an event happens, you want to think about what you need to do to kind of prepare for an event and kind of, you know, look at that event and think, is this a potential situation that could in involve into an active shooter situation? And, and address that situation before you find yourself in a situation like that. Um, you want to look at, you know, exterior parking areas, you know, uh, signage posted at driveways and entrances, posting, you know, that if you do have video surveillance, 
uh, signage posted about no weapons. I know, you know, that's a catch-22 situation, but you want to inform people that, you, you know, we are a no weapons facility. You know, obviously having well-lit parking areas with good vis visibility. Um, you know, think about where your trees and shrubs, shrubs are located, you know, especially to visibility, you know, around exterior doors, windows or anything. You want to be able to see around the exterior building. Um, you know, contact security or law enforcement t teams performing visible patrols. You know, if you have difficulties with, with certain patients, you know, reach out to your police departments, let them know, and see if they can do extra checks in your area, you know, to follow up, you know, especially maybe later on at night, you know, when, you, when you're, you know, people are laying out so that they, you know, they can do that and, and you know, make a, a patrol through your parking lot. Um, you know, designated areas for evacuation. So if you do have to evacuate an area, have a designated area where people can go in case you're in an event like that so you can, you know, keep track of everybody. You know, access control is, is a key. Uh, you know, limiting your access, you know, um, you know, waiting rooms and stuff. You know, we've designed rooms, you know, lately. It used to be, you know, in a lot of our off practices, you know, that our waiting rooms, people could just walk in the waiting room and get inside that, that area and, and now we're trying to lock and secure their areas so people don't have, you know, access to the entire building. Uh, you know, screening points so people can't tailgate or, or get in, you know, follow you in. You know, try to, you know, discourage that. Um, if you, you have the ability, you know, screen for weapons. You know, I know some healthcare facilities do that. Uh, we do that now when we're in a lockdown for our emergency department, and we do that later on at night at our hospital. You know, that's not an easy task, but I know there's are other facilities that are doing metal detection now. Uh, you know, make sure reception areas are well marked. Um, you know, patrolling activities, you know, that, so that, you know, no entry points are compromised. You know, checking doors to make sure that they're, they're, they're truly locked. Um, you know, doing exterior walkthroughs of the building. Um, again, you know, getting, you know, in touch with your law enforcement, you know, especially if you have a difficult patient or somebody, you know, let them know on what you're dealing with and, and they can maybe, you know, encourage you on what you can do. Uh, doing bad aud audits and stuff, you know, you know, making sure with, you know, terminated employees, turn in their badges um, or, you know, changing your keys out if you lose a key and that's not always an easy thing too. Um, you know, talking about patient care and treatment areas, you know, again, you know, controlling that access so that they don't have access to the back of your treatment areas. Um, you know, that staff are treated and how to recognize signs of potential violence. Um, you know, they're recognizing signs of suicide. Um, you know, that they're trained in the run, hide, fight. Um, you know, that staff knows where the safe havens are, know where rooms that they can go and lock and secure, or know where the exits are. Um, you know, encourage them if they see something to speak up. Um, you know, you know, doing drills, even if you can't do a full blown drill, you can do a tabletop exercise and kind of where you're sitting around the table and talk about what you would should do during a situation. Um, you know, going over your policies and again, you know, working with law enforcement to help you out in these situations. Administration buildings, you know, are keys, you know, strictly controlling those access because if someone's mad, they're usually mad at the higher up, so you want to make sure you control those areas. Uh, again, you know, make sure that security is informed or law enforcement, if need be, of employee, you know, uh, termination or counseling issues. You know, controlled spaces for sensitive conversations, you know, when you're dealing with somebody. Um, you know, billing disputes and stuff are conducted in, you know, private areas, you know, um, you know not out in the public. Um, again, talking about access to senior leadership, you know, you, again, uh, that everybody's trained in, in these drills. Um, you want to have, you know, how you deal with it and, and having a plan in place. Um, you know, you want to incorporate active shooter incident planning into, into your operation plan. So I'm, I'm sure most facilities have done that already, but if you haven't, you should have that in your policies and procedures on how you, you should respond to these events. A threat assessment team is a team with, which is a combination of, it could be security, it could be you know, the manager, it could be someone from human resources, it could be police, but if you're, you know, dealing with a difficult person, you can, you know, organize that team together and, and talk about that situation to see if there's any potential risk or threats or what you need to do, you know, such as, okay, are we going to terminate this, you know, patient from the practice, 
you know, is that safe to do, you know, other things that you need to do to, uh, you know, to remove those individuals from your facility. And again, it just, it reviews troubling and threatening behavior. And again, you want to form a team and it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal team, but how you should respond to those situations. So real quickly, I'm just going to go over this. I, I know I'm running out of time. Basically, when you're walking by yourself, you want to walk with confidence, look around, pay attention to what's going on. Um, if you see somebody, you know, make eye contact with them, you know, don't necessarily walk by somebody. Um, you know, a lot of people will put their heads down if they see somebody and what you're signaling to them if they're thinking about attacking you is you're putting your head down and saying, hey, if you're thinking about attacking me, go ahead because I'm not paying attention to you and I can't identify you. But if you look and, you know, you don't have to say hi to them or anything, but if you make, at least make eye contact, you're saying, I could possibly recognize you and identify you and I know you're going to attack me and they may look for an easier target. If you're walking around, you know, it, you know have your keys in your hand. Uh, don't necessarily, you know, especially late at night, you know, in case someone approaches you quickly, you want to have your keys in your hand. So if you need to get in your car quickly, you can. Um, you want to park in well-lit areas. If someone's near, you know, your car, you know, don't necessarily approach your car. Wait till that individual leaves, you know. Contact security if need be, if someone's by that car and they can go check them out. Um, you want to stay away, you know, from, you know, uh, bigger vans, you know, don't necessarily walk between parked cars, especially if you're in a parking garage. Uh, be careful when you're walking around, you know, if you just went to the ATM machine, don't, you know, display your money or, you know, don't, you know, be careful about whatever else you're displaying because, again, you don't want to make yourself a potential risk. If you do carry anything like pepper spray or anything, again, if you don't carry it with you in your hand when you're walking back and forth, it's not going to do you any good if it's in the bottom of your pocketbook or purse. Um, you know, lock your car at all times. Um, you know, keep your valuables out of plain sight. You know, check your car out before you get in your car because you don't want to be like the lady down here in the bottom of the picture got in the car and realized now someone's behind her here. And again, you want to pay attention to what's going on. A lot of us, you know, aren't paying attention. You see the lady here on the right-hand picture. She sees the guys behind her. That's the difference between the young lady here with the pocketbook dangling, you know, um, phone up to rear, kind of oblivious to what's going on. Um, in broad daylight, it's not a big deal. But if she was in the other position, she wouldn't have a clue that that person's behind her. And hopefully this video will show you why it's important to watch where you're going. And there's thousands of videos out there like that. Um, this lady was texting, you know, kind of hard to miss that big water fountain, but she did. But again, think if you're by yourself, um, you know, how potential risk she would be because she wouldn't realize that, it, you know, someone's possibly following her. But the bottom line is don't let fear, you know, rule your life. Um, you know, when you get on a plane, you know, the first thing they talk about is what to do if a plane, you know, is going to, you know, crash what you do. Um, you don't see people getting off the plane. You don't want to live in fear, but again, you want to prepare for these events so that in case you do are involved in an event, you'll know what to do. So you want to be aware of your environment, use common sense, and again, pre-plan these situations out ahead of time. Um, the Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security is a great resource. Um, there's a link to that that you can go on to, and it has a lot of good information on that. Um, you know, recognizing potential workplace violence. Um, again, this talks about, you know, recognizing what people are going through. So again, if you're having difficulty with patients or, you know, especially employees and stuff, and if they've changed, you know, over the, over the course of the months and stuff, you know, don't take that, you know, take that into account and, and follow up on it. All right, so um, I'm gonna turn that over for some questions. I know we're just about out of time here. Well, uh, Bruce, uh, I, I want to thank you for your presentation. You provided a lot of really useful information, and as such, we're, as you said, we're almost out of time. But what I'd like to do is I, I'm going to give instructions for people to uh, post questions. We may not be able to get to them, and, and we will be able to respond even after the webinar concludes. Um, and I believe your uh, email address and office phone number are provided in the chat 
uh, box as well to be uh, able to allow people to post questions, uh, you know, for you to respond to and all. But if you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box found at the uh, bottom of your screen. Uh, there's three dots there. Uh, you can click uh, there and open the Q&A uh, panel and direct your questions to all panelists. And um, uh, through the course of your conversation, there was a chat that was sent to you privately. So we do already have one question, and I know we're probably out of time now. But um, Mike uh, Kibitza asked a question about uh, if you can run, uh, what can you do with patients and staff and others who are with you but may not be capable of running with you? So maybe if you just take a brief moment to respond to that. At least we have that one question addressed. Well, yeah, if you, if you have non-ambulatory uh, patients, so that is difficult. So the best thing to do is try to get them into a secured room and, and lock the room. Like I said, if, if you have a patient you know, bathroom that you could possibly get them into, most of the patient bathrooms lock. That's one area you can. But again, you know, a hospital, it would be difficult for everybody to run or to evacuate from the building. So, so especially Especially with your, uh, you know, patients that can't walk, you're going to have to get them into a secured room where you can lock and, you know, keep them in there till the event's over. Uh, thanks. Um, and then we did have one question. Would it be possible to show this presentation to our emergency management group? And I assume that, you know, we've uh, since we provided the uh, copy of the slides to everyone, it would be something that they could show to uh, their management staff, correct? Well, that, absolutely. Yep. No, that's not a problem. And it, and like I said, if they have questions later on, you know, please, you know, reach out to me via email or phone. And I, you know, because uh, there was a lot of top, you know, a lot of things I covered today. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I know we're at time. So. Um, just so that you know, um, we do provide a continuing ed credit for this particular course. Um, so um, the the educational um, certificate of continuing education is a uh, one. Uh, CEU uh, for uh, Pennsylvania nurses. And to receive a certificate of continuing education, each individual requesting uh, credit must complete an evaluation. So the instructions are listed on this slide here uh, that's uh, up uh, in front of you. And if you are registered for today's webinar upon exiting, uh, you should get an evaluation that will be displayed in a new internet browser window. For those of you who did not register but are participating as a group, uh, it, please participate in the evaluation by copying and pasting the link you found on your screen or in the chat panel into a new internet browser window. And uh, just so that everyone knows, um, in order to get that continuing ed credit, the evaluations must be completed by May 31st. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I especially want to thank you, Bruce, for your excellent presentation and sharing your experience and information and knowledge with us today. So uh, if anyone has experienced any issues assessing the evaluation or certificate of continuing education, please feel free to direct any inquiries to uh, Shelly Mikesell at um, shmikesell at pa.gov. So this concludes our webinar for today, and I, again, want to thank everyone for participating. Have a good rest of All the right. day. All right. Thank you.